This is lecture number 15 on Deuteronomy by Robert Benoit. Lecture number 15. We want to ask a question about the altars. Why only earth and uncut stones for the construction of altars? Was that meant only for the wilderness? Hobart, whom we've mentioned last time, points out that it is not reasonable to conclude that this is a reference only to the wilderness. It was also meant for the time after entrance into Canaan. This was the kind of altar that was to be used. In fact, instructions for the altars were given in Exodus chapter 20, right at Mount Sinai. There is no thought at that point of forty years in the wilderness for the future of the Israelites. The golden calf apostasy had not yet occurred. The law had just been given at Sinai. The anticipation is that soon Israel will come into the promised land. In the Exodus 20 passage, there are strong regulations on how the altar was to be built, the place where it was to be located, which was removed from arbitrary choice on the part of the people. Notice it says, quote, that in all the places where I record my name, I will come on to you, end quote. So the regulations were on how the altar was to be built and the place where it was to be located, but it gives no indication that only one place was to be used for an altar. Certainly, it is clear that the practice during the time of Samuel corresponded to that law, and there was more than one altar. So Halwarda asks the question, how then do you harmonize Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 12? Do we adopt laws and conclusions, or is it a long period of development, originally with a multiplicity of altars and then developing into centralization of a single altar? Does Deuteronomy 12, in other words, really demand centralization and sacrifices at only one altar? So, the discussion of chapter 12, verse 14, really becomes a critical verse. You read in verse 14, well, let's preface that with verse 13, quote, Be careful not to sacrifice your burnt offerings anywhere you please. Offer them only at the place the Lord will choose in one of your tribes, and there observe everything I command you, End quote. So we read, not in every place, but in the place in one of your tribes. Alwarda says that you cannot stop with the first impression you may get in this phrase, in one of your tribes. According to Hebrew usage, that does not necessarily indicate only one, because frequently this kind of Hebrew expression can have the same idea as the English word any. So we can translate this phrase in chapter 12, verse 14 of Deuteronomy, in any of your tribes so that it could mean in any one of your tribes or in any number of your tribes. It's not explicitly clear what it really means, but it doesn't necessarily mean only one tribe. That is clear. Now, going back to Halwarda, what he points out is the analogy with Deuteronomy 12 and Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 6. In this passage, you have the regulation, quote, If a Levite comes... End quote. And notice the King James translates this part, And if a Levite comes from any of thy gates out of all Israel, where he sojourned, and comes with all the desire of his mind unto the place which the Lord shall choose, then he shall minister in the name of the Lord his God, as all his brethren the Levites do, which stand there before the Lord. End quote. Now, the expression in the Hebrew is really identical, but the difference is in the debate of the Hebrew word echad. Is it one of your gates or from many of your gates, from any of your gates? We've had this discussion before on the meeting of echad. But the point is that this is not a rule for a Levite coming from one particular gate or town, but for every Levite coming from any gate. So we read, quote, if a Levite comes, any Levite comes from any of your gates, end quote. That would be the right way to translate it. So the expression can be translated explicitly either way, from one of or from any of. It depends on a large degree on the context in which it is placed. 
But then you notice, getting back to Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 14, it says, quote, in the place, end quote. Isn't that in the singular? If more than one place was meant, would it not require a plural? In the places, for example, which the Lord shall choose. But again, not necessarily. It may, but not necessarily so. In Numbers chapter 16, verse 7, you read in connection with the uprising of the rebellion with Korah, Dathan, and Abiram in the wilderness. You read this, Take censers from all, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord thus chooses, he shall be holy. You take too much upon you, you sons of Levi. End quote. And so forth. Now, the point is that this phrase, the man whom the Lord thus chooses, end quote, the phrase is identical there to the man, singular. But the question is if the office of priests and leaders comprised of Moses and Aaron can be extended to the 250. There are 250 people that are involved. So the choice is between two plurals. But the text says, the man that the Lord chooses, he shall be the leader. It's singular. The meaning is clear in the context of numbers. The man is used whether there are two men or 250 men. It's saying, quote, the man whom the Lord will choose, end quote, but not necessarily or exclusively only one man. It's either Moses and Aaron or these 250 people that were taking the same office as Moses and Aaron. It's going to be the man which the Lord shall choose, but in the sense of more than one. It's those whom the Lord has chosen to be leaders. Now, I think exegetically you have to conclude on the basis of the expression in the chapter itself that Deuteronomy chapter 12 can mean one place and one tribe, or more than one place, but the Lord will indicate this in any of the tribes. It can mean either on the basis of language use. So that really, Deuteronomy chapter 12 says the same thing as Exodus chapter 20, verse 24. Quote, in all the places where I record my name, I will come unto you, and I will bless you. End quote. The question is not one or more, but whether the places are selected by human arbitrary means or by divine choice. It's not in every place chosen by humans, but in the place that is chosen by God that the sacrifices are to be made. Is that multiplicity versus centralization? No. The question is not one or more, but how the places are to be selected, by a human arbitrary means or by divine choice. That's the point. And at that point, there is consistency between Exodus and Deuteronomy. Halwarda also says that the motifs behind the specifications of Exodus 20 have been shown to have been a prohibition against precisely the kind of altar that existed in Canaan. Israel was to have a distinctively different kind of altar than the heathen Canaanites did. Their worship was not to be confused with the Canaanite worship. But the point of the regulation in Exodus is to make very clear that the Israelite altar is to be distinctively different from the Canaanite altars. Halwarda also says that Deuteronomy chapter 12 says that all the offerings are to be brought to the chosen place, or places, and then it is added the whole family will appear with servants and Levites. We read verse 18 of Deuteronomy chapter 12. Quote, now must ye stand before the Lord thy God in the place the Lord thy God should choose, thou, thy son, thy daughter, and thy manservant, thy maidservant, and the Levite who is within thy gate. End quote. Little King James English there. Now, what he points out is that this is the whole family with the servants and the Levites added in. Think of what that meant practically for a city such as Dan, which is north of Galilee, about 150 kilometers, or 90 miles, from Jerusalem. Minimally, three times a year, at the peak of harvest, offering a free will offering and other required offerings, the whole family had to make a trip to Jerusalem. Now, Halwarda, in his article, discusses what the meaning would be in the European context. It would be roughly an absence of a week, minimally, to go from Dan to Jerusalem and back. 
It would be like us today going to Florida or something perhaps farther to make these required offerings. I'm assuming, of course, when I say that, that one is now living in Florida. But what about the Levites? Consider if there were many family of Levites in the village. A Levite would be on the road all the time. Then Helwarda says, quote, Why, if you were a Levite from a northern town, not just stay in Jerusalem, since you have to come and meet the people there all the time? He says that there is an impracticality here to have only one place of sacrifice. So, these obligations could not be carried out at only one place. So, his conclusion is that Israel never had a law that bound the cult to one place. Rather, they always lived under a law that provided for local places as well as a central sanctuary, originally at Shiloh, but later on centered in the temple in Jerusalem. That doesn't mean that there wasn't a central sanctuary and there wasn't primacy of sanctuary connected with the ark and the temple, but that was not to the point of exclusiveness or illegality of any offerings at any other altars except at the sanctuary in Jerusalem. Halwarda concludes that what was regulated was the place where altars were to be built, not just arbitrarily anywhere, but the places that the Lord somewhat made clear. How? By theophany or whatever is not explicitly described, but it is restricted to places the Lord indicated. The materials out of which the altars were to be built were also regulated, and the offerings that were to be brought were regulated as well. So God provided for altars scattered at various localities, but that doesn't mean there is an altar in every village or every few miles, just arbitrarily anywhere, because in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 21, it says, quote, If the place which the Lord your God has chosen to put his name there is far from you, then you shall kill of your herd and flock which the Lord has given you and commanded you, and you shall eat in the gate whatsoever your soul desires. End quote. In other words, animals can be killed or eaten in places other than going into the sanctuary to slaughter animals. Distance might make that impractical, that is, driving your herd through the altar or to the sanctuary. So it sounds like altars weren't just anywhere throughout the land. There was some restriction in connection with the Lord's designation of certain places, but not restricted simply to a central sanctuary with all the other altars being illegal. So God provided many altars to keep all his people from the temptation of Canaanite worship all around them and to keep them in fellowship according to the provision in the sacrificial system that the Lord had made without making that system almost impossible to follow because of the extreme distances that would be involved to have everything happen in only one central location. Basically, that is Halwarda's view. I'd say you find roughly the same position in Thompson when you read his commentary and in his introduction. If you want also to see a very similar viewpoint, there's Manley's book, The Book of the Law, that I have asked the graduate students to read. Manley has a whole chapter on this, and basically he comes to the same conclusion as Halwarda. Manley says, quote, The centralization language use is capable of having this interpretation read out or into it. The real focus in the context of Deuteronomy 12 is not between many Yahweh altars and one, but between those Canaanite altars made to other gods whose name is to be destroyed and the place and name of the place where the Lord Yahweh shall abide. It is not their number, but their character which is in question. Whether the words be read according to one center or more than one, they do not exclude the possibility of other altars duly authorized. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 21 and 22 contemplate their existence, and in Deuteronomy chapter 27, the building of one is commanded. So it's not multiplicity of altars that is argued against in Deuteronomy. It is the kind of altar that is being built and where it is to be built. Another book is H. M. Siegel's The Pentateuch, its composition and authorship. It has a chapter on the centralization of worship, and that's page 87 and following. 
I could read that, but I think our time is just about up, and again, it's basically the same conclusion that we've seen before. So Harwarda, Manley, Thompson, Siegel generally have the view that the multiplicity of altars was not excluded in Jerusalem by Deuteronomic legislation. Now, it seems to me, just as we draw this whole introductory section to a conclusion, that there are three issues in Deuteronomic studies that are significant, on which presently there is a very solid orthodox counterpart to critical theories. The first is this whole structure of the book, and Klein's work and others with the Treaty Covenant analogy have given a good argument supporting the integrity and the unity and the date of the book of Deuteronomy over against critical theories. The second issue is this matter of centralization of worship, and that's critical to Wellhausen's view. I think the position of Hallwarda, Thompson, Manley, and others, that they face the issue and give an alternative position, putting the issue on quite a different perspective than Wellhausen does. And finally, the third matter, and I can't get into that because it's complex and detailed, but this is the matter of so-called progression of altars through the J-code, E-code, D-code, or Deuteronomy, the Holiness, and the Priestly Codes. In other words, a sequence of parallel development and change in some kind of historical progression. Manley deals with that beautifully in his book, The Book of the Law, Studies in the Date of Deuteronomy. He points out numerous problems with the scheme of JEDP's progressive development and successive codes. This requires a detailed consideration of specific laws that contrast with the Covenant Code in Deuteronomy and the conclusions that can be drawn from that. Manley's discussion of that is an excellent response countering Wilhausen. So in those three areas, structure and integrity, centralization of worship, and sequence of codes, in the past few years, there has been an enormous amount of work done from an evangelical perspective that I think is of great value to counter the positions that have just dominated the field of the study of the book of Deuteronomy. Well, that's it for now. Next class, we'll get into student presentations on Deuteronomy chapters 4 through 30. That ends Robert Manoy's discussion of Deuteronomy with Lecture 15.